My name is Craig Pickett. I'm an executive recruiter. More than a decade ago, I started my practice for one purpose, to use my experience as a former military aviator, business jet sales executive, and P&L leader to help aviation and aerospace companies and their executives be fast, adaptable, and strategic. I do these podcasts to inspire and inform, but more importantly, they are a focused platform to help business leaders grow. Welcome to the Aerospace Executive Podcast. Hey, welcome back to the Aerospace Executive Podcast. I am uh, I'm thrilled to have an old friend with me today, um, an executive I've known for a long time. It's Chad Cundiff. Chad is uh, the president of Astronautics Corporation of America. Astronautics is based up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, it's a privately held mid-tier avionics manufacturer. Um, over the years, last 60 years, it's, uh, it's put innovative products on more than 150,000 civil and military aircraft. Uh, Chad's an engineer by education. Um, he rose through the ranks at Boeing, uh, moved on to Honeywell, where he played uh, integral roles in the uh, development and marketing of uh, modern day enhanced and synthetic vision systems found on uh, most of your business jets and uh, commercial aircraft. Um, and he also uh, played a big role at uh, United Technologies, where he, uh, where he helped integrate Goodrich United Technologies aviation systems post merger. Today, he is uh, solely focused on growing astronautics and ensuring its, uh, its, its ongoing efforts in delivering innovative, cutting edge products to the uh, commercial, civil, and business and general aviation arena. Chad, how you doing? Great, great. Thanks for having me on today, Craig. Uh, super excited to be a part of the podcast and uh, talk about all the things we're doing up here at Astronautics. No, it's great for you to be here. But, but you know, one of the things I want to I want to say this straight up. Um, you know, you have had you know just in the last six or seven years since you've been president of Astronautics, you guys have really developed some great you know some great new things. You know, your your uh, your product line is is really uh, uh, at the cutting edge. Down at Bell Helicopter, Airbus. I know you've played some uh, put some great products on new Airbus on on uh, Airbus military aircraft what's what's coming down the pike what's driving uh what's driving the innovation yeah thanks thanks for asking and uh, appreciate the appreciate the uh, feedback on how we're doing there because i think you know last uh last six seven years here at astronautics have been a time of just fantastic change uh product development and building strong relationships with customers and and i think you know over the last period the last six seven years you know, we went from a company that was really reliant on legacy products that had been developed, you know, in our past, very successful products, you know, with electromechanical indicators that, you know, harken back to the work that Nate, uh, the founder of the company, developed with a core group of folks, uh, you know, to, to now, I think, really having a more relevant set of products that, you know, we're engaging our customers with. And for us, it's really been around three key areas. It's been around you know, the cockpit systems that's been a core part of an evolution of what we had with electromechanical indicators. Now we're putting a lot more uh, LCD displays out there, information systems that power those displays. Uh, and beyond that, uh, we've really embraced connectivity, uh, cybersecurity, and controls technology. And those are the places that we see a lot of growth with these markets. And, and within these last few years, uh, we've built in relationships now with Airbus Helicopter, Bell, uh, Boeing Defense that have just been fantastic, you know, great customers, uh, and we're very excited to be able to provide these these new products and new technologies with them. Did did um, you know? So going from you know you've got legacy products to all of a sudden now you're driving the future. Um, did you you know to get everybody to pivot? And start to look five years, ten years down the road. You know, you know, when you think about connectivity, now you're thinking about cybersecurity. Um, you know, you know, you're talking about your know, cockpit. You know, just pulling data from, you know, pulling maintenance data from the cockpit. You know, and the and and then putting it back in. You know, that that you know, that that creates different challenges in the form of yes, you know, hacker, you know, hackers and things like that. You know, yeah. was it was it a hard pivot? You know, when uh, when you came on board. Yeah, it's interesting because, uh, you know, the, and we've made some transitions as, as we operate our business too. So we went from, 
you know, an older facility to a newer facility. But, you know, the team had some, some great core technology, stuff that we developed as a part of the A400M network uh, security server. And, and uh, it, it, we had some technologies there, but, you know, there wasn't this embrace of, you know, we got to really get close to our customers. Uh, in, in, in some cases, customers we don't have today. We got to get close to them. We got to listen closely and come up with these new products. And I can remember walking around the halls, you know, after I got here and, and you know, folks would come in and, and we'd start talking about an idea and they'd have some pieces of paper and things like that. And, and, and invariably, you know, I'd say, uh, you know, look, we're a technology company. And they'd look at me like, what? And, yeah, we're a technology company. And it's, it, was, it was like, yeah, you know, why are we carrying around paper here? Why aren't we doing this stuff, you know, more data driven and getting, getting more electronic capabilities internal to the company and, and really embracing, you know, who we were as a technology company. And I think, you know, it's funny because you say stuff like that to folks. And so, you, you know, you challenge them a little bit and say, hey, we're a technology company, let's not do it that way. And then, you know, especially, uh, you know, as time moves on, you know, they start challenging you back. And so all of a sudden, you know, I'm saying, let's go do something. And they're like, Chad, that, that's the old way of doing it. We're a technology company. Let's do it. Let's do it this way, you know, and, and, and those type of things. And so, so I think, you know, just getting that thinking, getting that closeness with the, you know, the customers, developing those relationships, that's, that's been the heart of it. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of great folks here. There's, there's definitely some places to build. And, and like you said, some of the stuff just comes together. I mean, some of the work we've done in connectivity, you know, led to our work in cyber and a focus in cyber and, you know, it's led us to becoming, you know, a key researcher, you know, with the FAA, with others on cyber. And, and for us, you know, that just now becomes part of our DNA and it just builds on top of that stuff and opens more doors and more customers. And as people see what we're doing, invites more of those conversations and more of those chances for us to listen. Do you, do you find that, you know, being now, um, you know, you talk about three, three arenas that you're focusing on, cockpit systems, LCD supply, displays, and connectivity. Do you find that narrowing your focus as a company and just dominating and driving, you know, just driving that focus deep has really helped your your business versus some of the bigger guys who are trying to be a lot of everything to a lot of you know a lot of everything to everybody? Yeah, for sure. I think a company like us, we have to pick and choose our battles. And so so we've got to understand where our focus has been. At the same time, I mean our heritage here and and you know this this resonates with me. You know I got here, uh, and, and you know the legacy of Nate. Nate was here walking the halls and talking to me. And and uh, you know legacy of the company was not afraid to take on big new challenges. So so from the standpoint of you know if there's something out there that we think is can that there's a need in the marketplace, there's an unserved niche out there. We can go after that uh, if we just roll up our sleeves and understand the risk and attack it hard. But to your point, you know, we can't do that on 20 different things. So mm -hmm. it's a constant battle internally. Of what are the things we're going to focus on and how do we drive uh, how do we drive ourselves to be successful in those areas? And so so we do take on new areas. I won't I won't say we just limit ourselves, but at the same time, as we take on those areas, uh, we try and make sure that we take them on in a way that we've got the bandwidth to focus on them. And, and, and I'd say there's there's a real, you know, no fear. You know, we're not afraid of going after something that's hard here. Uh, we, we can go after those things and, and be successful at it. Cool. So, hey, Chad, specifically, you know, you guys have come out with some great press releases. You've got some new products on the market. You know, talk about those a little bit. Sure. So, you know, we break down, we've got uh, two uh, product lines within our business that uh, that we're focused on. One is what we call displays and cockpit integration. Uh, so within those, we've got uh, three major product lines. Uh, one is our Badger Pro Plus system, which is the integrated cockpits uh, that we're doing, you know, with Bell, uh, we've done with Pilatus, uh, you know, we do with retrofits, we do some C-130 retrofits. Uh, so these are basically a family of smart displays and sensors and control panels that uh, we come together and integrate with other equipment. Uh, the other product line we've got is the Roadrunner, which is our retrofit display system, uh, which we allow people to upgrade from an electromechanical or a CRT instrument in an overnight and get flying with LCD technology, be able to fly the latest WAS LPV approaches, uh, get some additional safety sensors going. 
so that's that's an exciting product line for us that uh, we've rolled out in the last couple of years. And then the newest of the product lines is called Ibex, and that is in essence what I like to call a semi-smart display system. Uh, these go in a lot of defense platforms, uh, and, and it's built around you know great video interfaces in Area Gate 18. Um, and so these new displays, uh, you know, it's it's they're they're uh, they're low temperature, if you will. I mean, in other words, they can tolerate very high temperatures because they're very efficient computing from that standpoint. And uh, we do a lot of stuff with video that our competitors can't match. Uh, beyond that, with displays and copy and integration, we do some flight controls work and we do a lot of custom displays. So we'll take pieces and parts from those, from those families I just mentioned and put them together for customers. A lot of times defense customers, but not always in a way that serves a unique function. And you got that special thing that nobody else can do for you. We can bring those parts together and do that for you. No, you do. Go. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Connectivity. Yeah. We've yeah. I was just going to say on connectivity. You know, uh, we've got our EFB position with Boeing. Uh, we're on every Boeing 787 uh, with the the Boeing EFB capability. We're integrating mobile. Uh, we're doing a lot of new mobile projects. And then we've got the air ground communication system, what we call AGCS, and and that's the newest product we've got. We've introduced that with Airbus helicopter. We're introducing that with other key customers currently. And that provides a great platform to get data on and off an aircraft uh, to enable the service offerings that a lot of OEMs are, are wanting to do. And, and for that, you know, we really focus on being the data moving guys. I like to sometimes say we're like three guys in a data truck. Uh, and mm -hmm. so we go in, pack up the data, pull it off the aircraft in a very secure way, get it wherever you want it and allow the OEMs uh, to then do the services that they want to do. And, 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 and there, we don't compete on services. Some of the other folks that try and do data moving also try and do services and they end up in a kind of a weird place. And, and you know, our, our excellence, our technology is really around getting that data securely wherever you want it. And so, so those are kind of the core new products that we've developed and rolled out. In each case, we've got a couple of variations on each of those um, already in work. And, and now we're starting to see that product line you know, blossom out as you start to say, oh, well, I'm going to take this IBEX display and I'm going to add these three things to that, or I'm going to add the connectivity element into a Badger cockpit. And so we're starting to see those things really start to proliferate as they're getting out in the market. Is it, you know, uh, yeah, open source is, I don't want to say it's open source, but these are things that you can, these are certainly products that you can continually build upon for more more capability without, it, without a, a complete redesign. Of the whole system. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing we do is is we're pretty open, you know, being a mid-sized company as compared to some of the bigger guys out there, uh, we're pretty open about interfacing with everybody. Uh, so, you know, there are folks out there that, you know, if you buy a display from them, well, you got to buy, you know, their radio too. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, especially in some of the helicopter and defense market, people have specific needs on certain elements. And I think one of the values that we can bring is, you know, we can bring our stuff together. But we can also integrate with other people's stuff, and so you know we're doing uh, we're doing a C-130 upgrades, for instance. We're doing one right now down in Peru, uh, and and you know there we're bringing in our core system. Uh, you know we're bringing in the smarts and the brains to get all the data up on the displays. But at the same time, we're bringing in you know weather radars and and comm radios from from other folks in the business and integrating all that for our customer. And so. So we're very flexible in terms of doing some work ourselves, but also being able to cooperate with others. Awesome. That sounds uh, and and it sounds like a lot of uh, you know, just the flexibility. Do you, you know, the flexibility of the whole thing? Does that give you a little bit more power at the negotiating table? Yeah, I think it, it gives us a little more power, and and it also you know gets us to the place where we're comfortable when we put a solution together. We're going for the best of the best, right? I mean, we're not. You know, I think uh, sometimes, you know, some of these companies, you know, they've got a whole portfolio of things and, and and there's some products in those portfolios that aren't as great as others, you know, but sometimes, you know, they'll try and bring them all to market and bundle them. And mm -hmm. as a customer, you're forced to take some of the weaker products to get the stronger products. You know, when you come to us, you know, we're going to give you the best of the best. And, and if it's our stuff, great. And if it's our stuff married to somebody else's stuff, that's fine too. And, uh, and we're okay with that. And so, yeah, I think that gives us some more power in the sense that, you know, we aren't coming with an agenda, if you will. Uh, yeah, it's a, you know, our customers can trust us. It's a little bit of power being focused, a little like like we talked about a minute ago. Yeah, just the yeah. You know, 
you know, the focus, the, the, the focus brings strength. Right. It brings strength. Right. And we're not, we're not here. We're not trying to get you to take this and that. And, you know, we're not trying to leverage you, you know, from the standpoint that, oh, you got to buy this from us and then you have to buy this too, or something like that. We're, we're here to really say, you know, we want you to be comfortable with the solution we're going to provide. And, and I think at the end of the day, that, that, that resonates a lot because, you know, like the data stuff I was talking about, I mean, I think, you know, we, we hear from a lot of customers, they're tired of, you know, trying to get data on and off their aircraft so they can provide services. Well, they're tired of when they go to some of these folks that try and sell them platforms like that, they're tired of hearing, well, if I, if I buy your data moving product, um, I've got to, I've got to let you offer competitive services or you're going to own the data or things like that. And, and from our standpoint, uh, you know, we're just much more about, yeah, you know, put our product on um, and we're very, we're very flexible at times. We can be very flexible around how, you know, the services get built around that, how the IP uh, constraints are, you know, we can be flexible with customers that want to own certain elements of that. And, and I think that gives us a lot of power in the marketplace, uh, you know, particularly from competitors that sometimes can be rigid around those things. Yeah, well, that's ultimately what customers want is they, they you know, a lot of times they, they want to, you know, I think they want a buffet. They want to be able to pick and choose what they want and customize their menu versus being, you know, taking, you know, the only offering that's being, you know, the only offering that's there, you know, it's like, look, you, you, you buy the displays, you buy the radio, you buy the weather, weather, weather radar, you buy everything. Yeah. And, and the power is the customers don't necessarily only want that. It's like, Hey, we, we just want displays. Can you, can you do it? And, and right. it's a good, it's a good story. It's a good story to tell when you're small. That's right. And, and, and we're more comfortable in those customers that need more high touch. And it sounds weird because we're a midsize as compared to some of the larger guys. But, you know, I think when you look at some of the larger guys in the market, things like that, um, you know, they've, they've done, you know, some work on developing synergies and, you know, they got portals and things like that. Um, but, but, you know, at times the customer wants to be able to get a real person, get an engineer, get somebody on site. And so we work very hard with our folks at trying to be very responsive and be able to ride that high touch and get, you know, get that answer, you know, from an engineer or from somebody else, from an ops person to our customer quickly. And, and you know, we, we still got room to improve there for sure. But, but I feel like that's a differentiator for us as well, um, where we're not forcing you into a website all the time or forcing you into, you know, some sort of, uh, call center or things like that. You know, you got an ability, I think, to interact with us and, and get a specific solution. And, 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 you know, by the same token, I mean, we can close a business case, you know, with a lower volume than some of the bigger guys. You, you know, we've mm -hmm. all seen with some of the bigger companies, you know, they want something that moves the needle for them, right? right. And, and, and they talk about that. And, you know, the things that'll move a needle for us are different than for them. And so, and so again, we can be more flexible, I think, in terms of changing products and technologies to adapt to folks. And that's, that's one of the reasons we've had a lot of success in the helicopter marketplace is because, you know, every helicopter, I always say this, every helicopter that runs off a production line, you, you know, is going for a different use. The operator is going to use that radically different from law enforcement to VI tree transportation to, you know, emergency medical and, and, and they need different, different elements in that helicopter. And so, you know, the more that we can flex and uh, provide some of that tailoring, you know, the more valuable we are to those customers. And so that, that for us is a real focus too, is to be able to provide that tailoring. Yeah, I got it. No, that's uh look, it's just the beauty of being small, you know, it's small custom, small personal service, customized service, you know, it's, um, you know, everybody, yeah. find, everybody has a little bit of a niche, you know, the big guys have a little bit of a niche, you've got your niche and it's a, it's a, it's about building on your strengths. Well, yeah, and I, yeah, I wouldn't call it small, to be clear. I mean, I think uh, we're a good size organization. I mean, it, we people get surprised how big we are sometimes. And I think I always say we're 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 right sized. I, I think, yeah. you know, we're big enough. We can walk into, you know, the biggest customers out there and and they have confidence that we can do projects uh, and they right. tell us that. And so because they know that we've got. A, a large enough scale that we can flex the staff and, and get a big project done and they don't have to worry about, you know, us getting halfway in and failing. But, but to your point, I mean, we are small enough that we could be nimble, make decisions quickly and get things out there. And so, you know, I say, you know, we're, we're at a really good size, you know, big enough to take on the big challenges, but small enough to communicate, to be responsive and make decisions quickly. 
No, it's awesome. Your background is pretty interesting. You came out of Boeing out of, as an engineer. You went, you know, at Honeywell, you had a great run at Honeywell um, to include developing and managing the, the, you know, the new uh, enhanced vision systems that are found on just about every you know, business, you know, large, large cabin business jet now. Um, how did that, you know, engineering and product development and, you know, uh, you know, product enhancement background that you bring to the table, how did it help you kind of get your arms around everything at, at Astronautics? Yeah, so, so, you know, I think some similarities from some of the things I did at Honeywell, you know, I had a responsibility for, uh, as you said, uh, for the, what became the enhanced vision, but really, you know, it was our overall displays and then a big chunk of our avionics portfolio at, at Honeywell. And, and uh, when I'd first taken that on at Honeywell, you know, there's some questions about what markets do we want to be in? Where do we want to be with those products? Uh, you know, we had a wide variety of legacy products there. And, and uh, you know, we got focused on things that we felt really add value to the customer. And at the time, you know, one of the key things, certainly not the only thing, but one of the key things at the time was the, was the introduction of what became synthetic vision. Uh, and so, so, you know, that was a real focus there at Honeywell. And so some of that coming in here, you know, is a similar sort of problem in the sense of, hey, we've got, you know, a couple of technologies here. Um, we've got, you know, a good sized company. It's got some scale to it. Um, but we need to go figure out what drives value with our customers. You know, how do we find those things that uh, can really build the company and allow us to grow those relationships and introduce, you know, value added products that, that will sustain the company for the future. And, and so it was really a couple of things, I think out of the shoot, I mean, the first thing you got to do in this business these days is establish trust. And, and mm -hmm. I think if you look at our track record, uh, you know, last uh, three and a half, four years, we haven't missed an OEM production delivery, hundred percent on time. And, and I think, you know, for a company where we're at sort of a mid-sized aerospace company, you know, that's first and foremost is you've got to put, be able to perform because, uh, you know, the, as you go out to sell your stuff, you know, scorecards are key. And then the second thing, you know, our quality has improved dramatically, too. Uh, I'd say we're best in class in terms of quality now uh, from an avionics perspective. And uh, and that was just, again, a nice focus from the team on, you know, where are we having issues? How do we resolve those? So so building that up, it shifted the conversations we had with our customers. You know, when we walk in to see a customer you know, we don't spend time making excuses or talking about why they didn't get what they had or things like that. You know, we spend a few minutes talking about our scorecards. I think everything's got to start with performance. And then we transition into, okay, what, what's keeping them up at night? Uh, what kind of things do they want to see? And from that, you know, we've built back some great relationships here. I think, uh, you know, we hadn't had a lot of work at places like Bell and Airbus helicopters in recent years. And, and uh, now we're on the process of, of being put in with the connectivity backbone on all the Airbus helicopter aircraft, uh, and and on Bell, uh, we're excited to be you know the cockpit uh, provider for the 429 and the 412. So so super exciting things happening. We're seeing a lot of things happen on the defense side. We're doing a lot of great work. Uh, teams doing a lot of great work with uh, Boeing Defense, and and you know with each of those, it's been just a story of you know perform you know, understand the problems and then move the business forward by developing solutions the customer can get engaged on. So, you know, everybody knows about, you know, in your space, you know, it's you know, being a being a small mid market company in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, you know, everybody really knows Honeywell, they know Rockwell Collins. You know, that's a challenge competing against the uh, the big guys. Um, you know, it can be a challenge. So yeah, you, know, you talk about innovation, you know, your speed to market is one thing I know you focused on. You know, talk about that a little bit, you know, going from, hey, you know, getting your board of directors to understand that to grow the company, we need to invest. And getting everybody else in the team on board to understand that a commitment to excellence is our only path. Right, yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's the old saying of uh, uh, time kills deals. I'd also say uh, time kills ideas too. Uh, you know, if you have a great idea, and we've all been there, you have a great idea and and you think about it, and then it sits there for four or six months, you know, invariably it doesn't seem like such a great idea after a little bit of time. And so, mm -hmm. so I think, you know, as we have great ideas, we try and move out on them. And, and I think a fair amount of that, one of the, one of the benefits we have of being a mid, mid-sized company is that, you know, we can make decisions quicker than other folks. You know, I often 
tell the story. We were talking with one of the large companies about a potential project we could do for them. And, and we talked about being able to get the product out, you know, in a year. And, uh, and, and they were shocked by that. I mean, because we've done new product, TSO'd, uh, avionics products inside of a year. And, uh, and, and, you know, they're looking, well, how can you do that? And, and uh, you know, the, the first thing I'll do sometimes is joke and say, well, we're just way smarter than everybody else in the business. And, and that's not really true, obviously. I mean, uh, you know, we'd like to think that, but, but there's a lot of smart people in our business. Uh, the key thing is, if you think about some of these bigger organizations these days, and you talk about decision making, you know, if they have a problem come up, uh, they show up, they have the team gets together, they talk about a path, then they realize they don't have the authority to make that decision, and then they have to get another meeting scheduled to get other people engaged. Invariably, there's probably another meeting after that. And so as they try and resolve problems, um, it takes them, you know, two to three weeks to make those decisions. You know, here we focus a lot on get together, make a decision. And yep. we're, we're, the, we're the size of a company that, you know, we can get everybody that needs to be there, there. And we have a cadence, you know, within our operating system of how we get together and make decisions. And, you know, there's a weekly cadence is a part of that. And so if people need a decision made, they know they can come that week and get that decision made. And, uh, and, and so for us, you know, it really allows us to eliminate ambiguity. Ambiguity is a big killer when you're trying to go fast. Uh, people yep. aren't sure what they need to be doing. If people have questions, if they're doing the right thing, you know, that slows them down. So a lot of what we try and do is get those decisions made, eliminate that ambiguity, get the focus on, let's get to the result and, and push harder there. And, and, and if you think about it, I mean, I just, you know, and, and I'll tell this to, you know, my friends that work at some of these larger enterprises and, and, and their eyes will just, you know, they'll lock in, they'll resonate on this idea that, yeah, you know, I was trying to get this decision made. They'll have examples in their head. Yeah. I was trying to get this decision made. Yeah. It took me two or three weeks, you know, for this thing that I thought was kind of obvious and two or three weeks for us to get moving on that. And, and, and so I think, it, you know, it's a real advantage for us. I mean, you know, there's, there's obviously some challenges in our business uh, competing with some of the scale and the breadth of product that some of the larger guys have. But, but I think on the flip side, you know, we've got the ability to be faster. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got the ability to be more innovative. Um, and uh, we've got the ability to try new ideas in a way that some of the bigger places don't. Uh, we can be very flexible in how we go to market, both from a technology and from a business side. Mm -hmm. And, and I give a lot of credit, you know, to our ownership. I mean, they understand that you know flexibility uh, gives us an advantage in the marketplace, and they're willing to look at deals maybe a little differently than I'd, I'd say some of the you know the the Fortune 50 companies that are out there that we're competing against. How'd you get your you know how'd you get your teams on board? You know when you came in, you're looking at legacy products, declining revenues. You know maybe uh, maybe an energized workforce, maybe not so energized. How did you get everybody you know really focused? You know, how'd you get the talent on board? How'd you get your, your engineers on board and everybody racing for, you know, the, to develop the next cool thing? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, a big challenge, I think, coming in is, uh, you know, I think everybody understood the need for change. I mean, there's a real desire to change. Uh, there's a real desire to new new products. Um, so, so it wasn't, you know, there wasn't a real need coming in here to make the case for change, if you will. Um, it wasn't a case where people looked around and said, oh, everything's going to be fine. That, you know, people are already had in their head that we need to change. You know, the trick with change, and, and we've all been there, uh, is, you know, sometimes, yeah, everybody, when they recognize the need for change, you know, they recognize the need for change of everybody else they're working with at the company, right? And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it's... <laughs> It's a case of, yeah, hey, we do need to change because, you know, I was working with Joe over there and he's not doing his stuff. And, you know, right. Sarah, Sarah over there needs to change. But, you know, I'm, I'm doing great. And uh, so I think some of this just, you know, getting everybody to, to look at the data. I mean, at the end of the day, I think the biggest biggest driver you can have to more effectively drive change is is to look at the data. And if right. you bring it, bring it back to the data be transparent about how you're driving change, um, you know, have a conversation where people are allowed to participate. But at the end of the day, you know, we're going to get together, we're going to look at the data, we're going to make a decision that's right for the company. And that's what we're going to try and do to execute against it. And, and, and look, I mean, I think, 
it, it's been it's been an interesting uh, it's been an interesting number of years. We've done a lot of new products. I'd say you know probably uh, in the ten years prior to the last five, you know we'd introduced a couple of new products as a company. We've introduced uh, over ten new products um, in the last five years, and and you know it just wow. poses a lot of challenges. I mean I think you know it's one of these things because you know, it's easy for us sometimes internally to get focused on the challenges we're facing uh, introducing all these new products because we're doing new things. I mean, we're doing things we haven't done at this kind of a pace before mm -hmm. and it's technology and it doesn't always work right the first time. And I think the key thing is just keep those lines of communication open and, and keep people working together. Like, yeah, okay, look, I mean, that design wasn't perfect and now we're having trouble producing it. Okay. But but, you know, rather than turn around and throw a rock across the way, you know, at somebody, let's let's get together, have that conversation, figure out what the solution is and move a little faster and getting that going. So so I think, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, people like doing new things. They like building new products. They like engaging new customers. I think, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of things people can get on board with quickly. And, and the big part of this is really keeping people on board and working together as a team as we work through these challenges. So, you know, you obviously came out of big companies, you know, Boeing, Honeywell, you were at UTC for a couple of years and helped with the uh, the Goodrich UTC merger. You know, what would you say to somebody who's coming from a big company to a small company, smaller company, and, and, and how do they have to adjust their mindset? Um, that's one conversation I have with a lot of folks. They're like, well, I, I'm, I'm more afraid of small companies for whatever reason. You know, how would yeah, you it's, it's tough, I think, for some folks. So I'll tell you a story about my past. And, and, and I think uh, uh, maybe this will kind of talk a little bit about, you know, I think people, how you how you have to make those adjustments. Uh, so so I left Boeing uh, and I won't say the year because it's been a couple of years now, but uh, and, and came to work uh, for uh, Bendix King, which was part of Allied Signal, which became Honeywell. And so so, you know, I had a run there where I had different business cards for a number of years, but worked for the same company. And, uh, and when I came into work at uh, Bendix King, uh, you, you know, in the flight test group, because, you know, I was coming in and going to do some flying and things like that. And, uh, you know, we had to go develop some test equipment. Um, and I came out of Boeing, big company, you know, big organization. You know, you had this flight test group and you had these groups that developed test equipment. And I got pointed uh, to a test bench we had at Bendix King. And somebody said, there's the soldering iron you know, go put those cards together. And, and it was like a light clicked on at that point, uh, which was just to, to the fact of, wait a minute, I can't go build the test equipment myself. And, and, and even though that's not my job, I'm not a test equipment specialist at this company. I'm, you know, flight test engineer. I'm gonna be doing some flying, things like that. Uh, but, but instead, you know, I'm over there soldering on the board and learning how to solder. And I think, I think when you get in a company this size, uh, you've got to have that mentality of, you know, I'd say sort of a renaissance mentality of, you know, I can figure this stuff out. And we've got a lot of folks here that, you know, if they don't know how to do something, you know, they're on the internet, they're talking to friends, they're going to learn. And, and I think when you come to a company this size, you're not always going to have the expert uh, like you would at a big company in the particular topic you're digging into. Um, and so you got to learn how to, you know, learn yourself. Uh, you've mm -hmm. got to learn how to engage your network. Um, and, and engage the resources that are out there. And you got to be a little scrappy. And I think, uh, you know, for us, it, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge because, you know, we'll recruit uh, folks. We want to recruit folks with uh, avionics expertise. And a lot of those folks, like you said, you know, may have had some experience in one of these bigger companies. And, you know, some of it's, you know, as we go through the interview process is just trying to understand, do they have that little scrappiness about them? Like if they come in here mm -hmm. and, and we say, yeah, you're, you're head of sales for the region, but oh, by the way, you're also going to have to set up and tear down the booth at the big show there too. Right. Uh, you know, does that, do they like, oh, okay, I'm no problem. I got it. Or is it like, what? I have to do that. You know, because there are yeah. folks out there that, that don't want to do those things. You know, they want to do the thing, uh, their core thing. And in a company like ours, I think you've got to be willing to, to do what needs to be done and, and get the job done. How are you uh, adjusting your recruiting tactics? I mean, you're in, you're, you, you guys are based, your headquarters is up just outside of Milwaukee. Um, some people get a little scared, yeah, especially if they're in Phoenix or Florida, they get a little scared of Milwaukee in the wintertime. Um, you're a smaller company, you're developing some great things. 
how how are you adjusting your recruiting tactics? What do you uh, yeah? What well, do you so so we do have an operation down in Arizona, and uh, we're currently looking for a few key engineers down there. So I think uh, uh, so we do recruit into Arizona. So I don't want to scare anybody that's in Arizona listening to this and maybe wants to come work for us <laughs> off right. right up front. Uh, we'd love to have you join us down there in in Phoenix. Uh, but I think you know for us, uh, you know, and I, I say this all the time with our folks. I mean, I think it's a lot easier to grow a great talent than to steal a great talent. Um, and so, you know, we spend a lot of time, you know, working on when we talk about recruiting and building talent, you know, we talk about, you know, getting new hires and uh, growing those folks. And so uh, you know, we've got, I think, a little bit of a competitive advantage being here in Milwaukee. Milwaukee, uh, you know, as I've come to find out in my time that I've been here is a little bit of an overgrown university town. We got three large universities here that uh, produce talent for us. Uh, MSOE, which is a fantastic engineering school. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got Marquette, and we've got the uh, University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, which is which is you know probably the second largest part of the Wisconsin uh, university system. And of course, we got UW Madison, an hour and a half down the road. And uh, we built relationships with those universities at various levels. And and uh, our goal really is to find that talent early on, um, bring those folks in. We love to bring them in as internships. Uh, we take a lot of pride that when we bring somebody in an internship, they're doing work. I mean, they're not, we don't put them in a corner and say, read this manual or try and figure this out. I mean, they become integral to our projects and they, they are dependent on to get their work done as a part of us getting our projects done. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so we challenge them. And then, you know, for the folks that we want to convert, uh, we try and get the offers out there early. I, you know, uh, one of the presidents of, of uh, universities here locally told me, he says, you know what, if you get if you get a, a college uh, student an offer early and they accept, you know, yeah, they may keep looking. But but we all remember our senior year in college. Right. And and if you have a job offer in your pocket and you're relatively happy with it, yep. uh, we all know there's other things that college students in their senior year can find to do with their time other than keep looking for a job. And, uh, and I think uh, that's been a key thing for us. And so we get those folks in and, and try and grow them. We still, uh, we do try and recruit uh, mid-career talent, uh, you know, cause you gotta keep a good mix in there and, and, you know, you can bring in folks that have a different perspective. And so, so we work both elements of that, but, uh, but I think for us, it's really about, you know, trying to grow that talent uh, from the ground up. Yeah. And, and, and what are the, you know, the, the the kids coming out of college. I mean, I, I think a lot of them are just brilliant. I mean, I I yeah. mentor. I, I think that they're you know incredibly smart, um, especially compared to some of the you know me and some of the other folks I graduated with you know, 30, 30 some years ago. I'm like, wow, these kids are really. I'd big. say they're they're also a lot more mature. I would say. I mean, in a lot of respects. I mean, some is, you know I know everybody's got their little complaints and things like that, but I, I'd say you know kids today. I mean, they just I think they deal with. Uh, understanding that they is a much more public world, right? I mean, you know, there is much more awareness about what you do and things like that. Right. And I think because of that, I mean, I, I also feel like there's a level of maturity uh, about some of their decisions and things like that, that, that you didn't see uh, in the past. Yeah, they're much more focused. Look, yeah, I've got two kids in college now and, and I mentor some kids at the university and, and you know, I find they're very, they're very focused on, excelling at the things that they're doing and then they have that you know we could talk about that all day the the big social you know do what's right you know do what's right thing and i think that's playing real well into you know their their career choices you know, and of forward. course i mean we're recruiting technical talent so i think you know i think the folks that uh, the the students that go into uh the technical professions and you know spent the time working through an engineering degree you know, I think with those folks, I mean, there's this level of discipline and level of drive that that's associated uh, yeah. with those with those types of students. And you know, I, we talked a little bit about MSOE. I mean, I think you know one of the things you know they talk about with their students coming in is they talk about this is going to be hard. Uh, you know, so it's it's the mindset of you're taking on something that's hard, right. and so you've got now people that are self-selecting into a career they know is going to be hard. Uh, from a work and a technology standpoint, but but they're up for the challenge, and and so for us, I think that's 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 something we're looking for. We're looking for people that want to come to work and do hard things, uh, and so it's you know you got to find that fit, and and they've got to be interested in our business as well. 
Awesome. Yeah. Hey, let's switch gears a little bit. Um, you talked about building great relationships now with some of the OEMs. I know you've got, you, you, you built a relationship with Bell and you're building some products for those guys. Your you know, Airbus helicopters, you've built some great relationships with, uh, with them. Um, on the defense side, you know, what's, what's driving those positive relationships and what's, you know, what are, what's the future of, you know, what, what are the future systems that we're not looking at now that are going to be, you know, really prominent in four or five years as the industry continues to, to move forward? Yeah. So, uh, I, you know, I don't know if I can tell you all of our secret sauce right now, cause we're still under the, you know, still in the development phase with that, but, but I think, in terms of what builds relationships, at the end of the day, it's trust. And I think for us, you know, it's about executing on what we said we're going to do. Right. And, uh, you, you know, I think for us, I mean, we talked about some of the improvements we've had on the operations side um, and, and you know, on the technology development side. I think our teams are doing a good job. I, now, I'm not going to say all of our programs go off without challenges. I mean, you're going to have challenges anytime you're developing technology and trying to do something new. Uh, you, you know, the systems we did with uh, Airbus helicopter, you know, which are geared around taking data on and off the aircraft and integrating, you know, with their services platform. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that was a that's that was a new product. And I think on both sides, their side and our side, uh, you know, there was there was some learning to be done about how that would really work. Mm -hmm. And so there was some changes there. But there's also a real desire to get that product out there quickly. And so, you know, from the time we signed the contract to the time essentially we had the product done, you know, it was under two years. Uh, so, so it's, you know, it was a very rapid development, you know, if you look around and, and see some of the other things going on. And, and I think for us, the big piece about doing that well with them was about communication. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it, at the end of the day, it's about being flexible, communicating, what do they have to have? What do we need? you know, is there a way that we can find a way to make those things meet? And, and we adopt a lot of, you know, newer things, if you will. I think, uh, it, you know, we try and be careful about what we adopt. But, but for exa example, most of our programs are now have gone to an agile-based uh, methodology. Uh, and we like the agile-based methodology because we think it helps mostly with communication, real-time communication. And so, you know, we get these two-week sprints, you know, we get the teams back together, we're communicating with our customer. We're talking about what we accomplished. We're talking about how much we're accomplishing, how fast, and then and then making up the plan for the next couple of weeks and making that making that next jump. And you know, for us, those are all reinforcing things to to helping us go faster with our customer and and building that trust and that relationship, so that when the customer calls us up, you know, they have confidence that we're going to execute and they have confidence that if we hit a problem. We're going to communicate with them openly and honestly, and that we're going to adjust and make the right decisions and get that taken care of. Now, did you talk about when you're building those relationships? Did you, you know, a lot of times it's a build it, you know, was it a build it and they will come type of deal? What would you like us to build for you? What would be most advantageous? Or did you come to them with products and ideas? What, you know, how did all those relationships really, you know, expand? Yeah, I, I think if you look, you know, folks, uh, if you look back on the history of astronautics a little bit, and folks would say this a little bit uh, when we first started rolling into some of these new products, and, and, and the historical thought was astronautics was really good at send us an RFI, we'll quote the RFI and go build it for you. Mm -hmm. but, but I would say, I don't think that works in aerospace today. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, I think at every level, you know, customers are looking for people that can bring ideas. Uh, so they have a little bit of an idea, but mm -hmm. but in a lot of cases, you know, customers are looking for people that will add value. And so not just respond to an RFI and give them a quote to, to do something that they spec out in great detail, but now instead to, to come forward and say, you know, hey, I, the OEM, have this problem. Tell me mm -hmm. how you would solve it. And, and we've got to come in there with those ideas. And so, so a big focus for us has been, you know, really, I think, uh, trying, to, trying to come to our customers with ideas. So if we know that we're going to have a discussion with a customer, you know, we push our teams hard. Okay, well, what are you bringing to the table? What are we going to go in there and, and I like to say challenge the customer with? You know, what idea are we going to throw on the table and say, hey, we think this works for you. Tell us why it does or it doesn't and help us get calibrated. 
Mm-hmm. At the same time, you know, I, I think, you know, I think uh, we're not in a market uh, that, you know, it's it's a build it and they will come type thing either. I mean, there's some things that we may do like that. You know, we've done the Roadrunner where we built up a dealer channel and uh, came up with a product to replace the legacy electromechanicals we had out there. Um, you know, and that's a little bit maybe more along the build it, uh, they will come type. But mm-hmm. a lot of times it's that interaction uh, with our customers where, you know, we try and come with some strong ideas, uh, with some components of technology and listen and then try and adapt what we're doing, you know, to fit the need that they have and work that through. Uh, so I think, you know, it's, 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 avionics is complex. I love it because every day is different. Every day is a challenge. Uh, but, but within avionics, you know, we've really got to find a way to, to have that core already built up that gives us the ability to come in there and develop a solution quickly. So, so part of it, we've got to push the technology we think in the right direction and then find a way to meet our customers in the middle, if you will. Yeah, I gotcha. Hey, let's, uh, you know, let's start to, you know, Wrap it up. Industry's challenged right now. Commercial side, Boeing, you know, obviously has had its struggles, you know, the COVID coming in. Where are the opportunities, do you think? Um, you know, moving, moving forward, I, you know, my sense is that this is just the beginning of a new cycle. Where do you think the opportunities for companies like Astronautics and everybody else to excel really, really lies? Yeah, it's, it is a new industry. And, uh, you know, I loved listening to the leasing conversation you had on the podcast, I think, what, a week or two ago. And, uh, and just, you know, the dynamics there, it's, it's fascinating. But I think, you know, where are the opportunities? I mean, you know, we're excited about what's going on in the vertical lift market. Uh, you know, we've been deep into, you know, helicopters for sure. But, you know, vertical lift more generally, I think, you know, in the last three to four years, uh, we think it's an underserved market. Uh, and we also think, you know, there's some real growth coming. Uh, you know, there's there's all the work that's coming for some of the urban air transport. You know, there's a lot of delivery stuff. There's there's a lot of things there that we think are exciting. And so I think, you know, when we think about the technology there, you know, obviously we think about a lot of the things we do, information sharing, connectivity. Uh, we've got a fairly strong controls capability as well. Uh, you know, and, and so we feel like we can bring a lot into that market and that segment. You know, I think, um, you know, I think we're all kind of a little bit scratching our heads right now on air transport and trying to understand, you know, what is that going to look like and 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 how do we come out of this uh, COVID? And, and at the end of the day, I, I think you, you try and think about it a little bit and you try and predict, but a lot of what we try and do is be adaptable as well. Uh, so that, you know, that if we start to see a sign, you know, that our our eyes are outside, you know, we're listening, you know, we're, we're trying to understand what's going on so that we can detect, you know, what's starting to happen ahead of other folks and adapt to the changing landscape. And so, you know, we try and be fairly flexible, not very rigid as we make these changes in this dynamic environment. And and, and I don't think anybody really knows, I mean, between, you know, the COVID situation, uh, between, you know, the election cycle, between, you know, some of the things we see in the global stage these days, you know, I'd, 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 uh, I, I'd, I'd challenge anybody to say they can really predict it. And, you know, Craig, you know, you and I both have seen, you know, all the companies that rolled out vision 2020 type plans, you know, four to five years ago. Right. I, I'm pretty sure nobody predicted 2020 and their vision 2020, the way it's rolled out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no. Uh, yeah. I, like, like I say, Harry Potter himself couldn't, couldn't conjure up more crazy than what we've seen is, is this gonna hamper? I mean, you know, obviously, you know, money is it? You know, cash is at a premium in the commercial space, especially. Is this going to hinder innovation for the next four or five years, or you know, hey, look, let's just get through this hiccup, and you know, get back to where we, you know, get back to business, get back to where we were. Um, yeah. You know, I, I tough, don't know. Tough it's, question, it's, but tough question. Yeah, but, no, it's a yeah. tough question. I, mean, I think I think there's there's kind of two different things when you talk about innovation. Uh, you know, when I think about, you know, the actual innovation itself, uh, you know, a lot of that, you know, my experience has been you get a couple of passionate folks and you turn them loose, right? It's, and it, it tends not to be big dollars. I'm very wary of the, of the folks that come to me and say, well, I need $4 million or whatever to, to go prove out an idea. And I think this idea is very innovative. Uh, you know, my experience, you know, folks that have the real innovative ideas, you can sort of prove out the idea you know, with a with a much smaller budget, and and what you're really looking for is the passion. So I think the innovation's there. I think 
The other element though, is sometimes bringing those ideas, those innovations to scale and, uh, and, and, uh, and productizing them and the challenge of getting through that. And, and I think uh, there, I think, you know, my sense is that there's going to be money available for, for those right ideas. Um, it, there is going to be some challenges in that, you know, people may be slower to adopt, but at the same time, you know, the, the landscape's changing very fast. I mean, I think, you know, just, you know, not in aerospace, but look at retail and what's going on there. Mm -hmm. You know, what we're seeing with COVID is a huge acceleration. And so the people that have the right technology and the right ideas, you know, they're hiring like crazy. Um, you know, they're investing in their technology right now. And I think the people that unfortunately their business model is perhaps, you know, structurally challenged uh, are seeing that disappear. So I think, I, I think, I, I think this is a great time to be innovating because I think, you know, it's a very dynamic time and I think people are going to, are going to shift as part of that. And so if you can come up with the right solutions, you know, in some respects, you, you know, maybe it's a little better than, you know, the place we were, you know, a couple of years ago where you got a very consolidating industry that's kind of structurally sort of set. Those yeah, boundaries well, are getting broken up. Let's talk about that real quick. Yeah, now, now you got me. Let's talk about that. You know, you've got these massive, you know, uh, my sort of opinion has been when I saw the, you know, the huge consolidation, I, I said to somebody a couple of years ago, I go, wait a little while, all that consolidation will start to unconsolidate. I mean, you got to keep, you know, the, it's, it's very hard to keep feeding the big machine. Um, you know, do you, do you think that a lot of these big companies that were maybe consolidating in response to, you know, partnership for success or some of the other you know, reasons, do you think that they do start to break themselves up and break themselves down into smaller, quicker, faster teams? Yeah, I don't know. I have a hard time sort of figuring out what they're going to do. But but there's a couple of things I do know. And that is that, um, you know, if you're trying to innovate, if you get, and, and this is the way most companies get organized as they get bigger, is they start to functionalize. And, and then they get, let's say, eight people in a room looking at new ideas, and everybody in that room has a veto. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I will guarantee you there is not a novel concept in the world that if you put it into a room with eight people with a veto, it will not get vetoed. Uh, it's, just, it's just nature. And, 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 yeah. and, and I, I tell stories to our folks about things that I've killed in the past that actually were good ideas. I mean, so we're all, we're all guilty of it at some right. level. I mean, we all have our biases and our prejudices. And so I think, uh, you know, so I think it's very hard for bigger companies to innovate. And then we talked about the speed of decision-making in those companies and things like that. And so, so I think, you know, are they going to push back from the functionalization they've done? Well, they've gone to functionalization because they're trying to scrape that cost out because the technology is mature. So I think what will start to unravel those things is was when the technology pace starts to move faster. So as when we come up with new platforms and new solutions and those type of things, you know, then, then those big consolidations with big functional matrices are going to have a really hard time moving the technology at the same speed that, you know, an organization that's set up more like ours, uh, which I would, you know, say it's more like a general manager type setup, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they can move faster, make decisions independently and, and go. And so I think, yeah, I think as technology starts to change, as new platforms come on, I think, I think the, I think, you know, there is going to have to be within those, within those organizations, they're going to have to either decide to, you know, change their structure a little bit, provide more autonomy out there, um, mm -hmm. or, you know, they become, you know, they serve the markets, they serve well, you know, yep. for the, for the folks that are flying aircraft that are 20, 30 years old, and they just want to keep seeing that cost come down. You know, those organizations do a great job. Yeah, I got you. Well, it's, it's a good opportunity for, it's a good opportunity for you. Yeah. Smaller oh, yeah. company, we, smaller company nimble, it. quick, you know, and uh, innovative. It's, uh, it's, it's a great spot for you to be in. No, it's great. I mean, we love it. I mean, I, I think, you know, when those changes happen, you know, I, I, I smile a little bit because I know that we're going to be able to take advantage of the opportunities, how those changes uh, faster than uh, some of the other folks out there. Yeah, I mean, obviously, yours has been a great success story. It's been it's been fun watching you. It's been fun watching all that success from you know kind of across the uh, across the street over here. Yeah, and, we've had, uh, we've got a great team up here. I mean, I think uh, you know we've done a lot of stuff in the last uh, few years, and you know I think we're really starting to hit our stride now. Uh, we were super excited at Heli Expo this year down there. I mean, just being able to talk about some of the products we've done with Bell and Airbus Helicopter and the Roadrunner and 
you know, I think just to see the momentum that we had carrying into the market, unfortunately, you know, it was probably what, three, four weeks after that, you know, where COVID really hit us hard. I mean, I remember being at Heli Expo this year and we were talking uh, with some folks about Singapore, which would happen a couple of weeks later. And, you know, Singapore was just starting to unravel at the time in terms of people attending and canceling their plans. And it was all related to COVID. And, and so, you know, the world's changed a lot, uh, but, but, you know, we think there's a lot of momentum about what we're doing. And uh, we think we can provide a lot of value in this industry. And, and so for us, I think it's continuing to look for, you know, people that are looking for somebody to come in and shake things up a little bit, if you will, and, and, and move a little faster and challenge them with ideas. And, and uh, you know, we've got some growth and opportunity to get better at that, but, but we feel like we're really good at it today. Well, let's come back and uh, revisit this. Uh, yeah, let's come back post COVID and, uh, and talk about the opportunities once we're back on the, uh... Yeah, back on the right track. And, it sounds good. You got a date for that forward. yet? Um, yeah, I'm like, hey, look, I thought COVID was going to be a week. You know, I yeah, I'm like a horrible predictor of whatever. I said, yeah, you know, next week we'll be out beyond this. And, uh, yeah, I yeah. feel bad for I feel bad for diminishing the uh, the importance of it. But yeah, let's give it another month or two. How's that sound? <laughs> sounds around. good to me. <laughs> I, I hope it is that quick. I think, you know, for everybody, it'd be great. I mean, obviously, we all want to see this get behind us. Uh, but, uh, yeah, in the meantime, I mean, we're going to deal with the facts on the ground as they are and uh, keep trying to do what we do well. Hey, thanks for coming on today, Chad. Thanks, Craig. Appreciate, uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. We'll talk soon. All right. Take care. I hope you enjoyed the latest edition of the Aerospace Executive Podcast. You can reach out to me directly, Craig, at NorthstarESG.com or check us out at www.northstaresg.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, or on YouTube. Just do a search for Aerospace Executive Podcast. Thanks again. I'm Craig Pippen.